thank you, Jim. Thank you, Ralph, for your hospitality this morning and for the invitation for our members to come and interact with you and tell you a little bit of story. So um, as they're getting settled in, let me just give you two words. Number one, uh, the, in terms of all the end of year drama and consternation and hand wringing and anxiety and so forth, I am sensing that the traffic is actually starting to move. We've had a good, good week. Um, didn't start out as a good week, but I think it's going to end as a good week, and I think our members are coming together around a plan, and uh, there's a sense of clarity and purpose that we're driving towards this fall. And I think there's actually some good things that are happening there uh, around debt ceiling, CR, and all the typical countdown drama. As it relates to tax reform, I just want to give a special shout out to my colleague and chairman, Dave Camp, who has managed this process um, brilliantly. He's done a very good job of not just a Washington savvy process, which we all admire, how he's lowered expectations and overperformed and so forth, but he's been highly collaborative. He's created a process by which members are able to come together. And remember, it was crazy talk, and I told this to Dave to his face yesterday, it was crazy talk when Dave Camp started talking about tax reform. And nobody would say it to his face, but we were all thinking, how nice for you. You know what I mean? If you have your little ways and means chairman, if you want to reform the tax code, why don't you go talk to the fern in the corner? That's the likelihood of you reforming the tax code. But Dave Camp was tenacious and clear and laid out an agenda over the past Congress of competitiveness. And what he has now successfully moved is from crazy to possible. There's nobody in this town that says it can't happen. And that is basically due to the tenacity of drive and drive of one person. And that person is Dave Camp. So let's talk about a couple of other people. Um, what I'd like to do now is introduce each of these members individually, hear from them, um, and then we're going to have time, I think, for us to, to have a question or two directed their way. So clearly the hardest working guy in show business this year has been Congressman Frank Lucas. Frank chairs the, uh, the Agriculture Committee. You talk about a listening, long-suffering, um, very gracious, he's got the discipline not to have every thought bubble come out of his mouth. Um, like, uh, I, I know of some of these conversations that he's been in, but he has been clear in saying, look, we need a farm bill, and we're gonna put a farm bill together uh, no matter what, and, and we're on the cusp of accomplishing this. We'll pass this nutrition bill today, and I think it is, it is in large part due to his expertise on ag, his willingness to listen to a conference that has a wide range of opinions on ag, and his experience of being here for, uh, he's now in his 11th term. He's a member of the Republican Whip team, which I'm proud to point out. And without further ado, let me uh, introduce my colleague, Congressman Frank Lucas. Thank you, Mr. Whip. <laughs> and simply note to everybody, the challenge of passing an every five year farm bill is an important piece of legislation. Not only does it assure us the production of, but the ability to consume the healthiest, most affordable, safest food supply in the history of the world. In this Congress, as in the last Congress, it was very clear from the House Republican perspective, anything you do, whether it's reauthorizing anything, you have to spend less money. You have to have reforms. You have to, you have to address the national debt and the annual deficits. So in our version of the Farm Bill, uh, the commodity title, we would spend $20 billion less, and this is a bill passed across the floor of the House, $20 billion less in mandatory money. Not the discretionary numbers, the real spending problem, mandatory money. And we've had a couple of gyrations in how we're putting the social nutrition bill together. And today, as the whip alluded to, we will bring to the floor and pass, I believe, uh, a bill that will also substantially reform uh, the food stamp program to the tune of savings of about $40 billion. So literally, uh, when we go to conference with the Senate, the House will be in a position to say that in comparison to the previous Farm Bill, we want to spend $60 billion less than the previous Farm Bill, and yet meet our obligations for both a safety net for the production of and a safety net for the consumption of food. But that's not been without challenges. Today on the floor, uh, if any of you have insomnia and watch the replays that I don't see span, you'll hear the most amazing discussions. But understand this. 
The principle of the bill we bring to the floor today, quite simply, is we're going to help everyone who needs help. But you have to play by the rules. You have to show your income and your assets. You have to show you qualify. And oh, by the way, if you're able-bodied and you don't have dependents, you might have to work 20 hours a month to get your food stamps. Show you qualify, work for your help. That's reasonable. That's where we're trying to go in the Republican House. Good. Well done. Um, our next speaker is Congressman Mike Simpson. Now, if you think about the, the, the committee that has undergone the biggest challenge, and frankly, the biggest change, without question, it's the appropriators. The appropriators have come in and they have done the work that a Republican conference asked them. The GOP conference passed a budget, the appropriators hit the mark time and time and time again. And it is a committee that, in my view, is largely underappreciated. Um, to go from the way the appropriators used to appropriate, now to being an appropriator uh, in this environment is as challenging an environment as, as ever existed. Mike Simpson is a, um, is a dentist, so when you think of him, think flossing. It's what you need to do. Um, he has uh, also served in the leadership in the Idaho House, and he was the former Speaker of the Idaho House. So please welcome the gentleman from Idaho, Mike Simpson. Thanks, Peter, and thank all of you for coming today. It's nice to have breakfast. Being from Idaho, I have to tell you, it was a great breakfast. It could have been a wonderfully great breakfast. We had potatoes. <laughs> I don't really care if you eat them, just stir them up. Do whatever you have to do. Anyway, it is uh, it is good to be with you and talk a little bit about what's going on in Congress and my role and what we're trying to do. Obviously, on the Appropriations Committee, I noticed uh, someone said this morning the wonderful, important Ways and Means Committee. Nobody says that about the Appropriations Committee anymore. But what we do is obviously important, and we have been making some very difficult votes trying to meet the budget resolutions that were passed by Congress. And what we need to do, frankly, is there's a disconnect. I noticed back when I was in the state legislature and also in Congress, between a budget resolution that passes and what it actually means in appropriation bills. It's easy to go out and be the most conservative guy in the world and say, I want to cut more and more and more, and let's cut another $100 billion out of the budget resolution without knowing what that means in individual appropriation bills. Now, three years in a row, this is the first time this committee has actually, since World War II, three years in a row we've actually reduced spending. First year we did it, we were coming off four years of increases of Nancy Pelosi's huge increases, so reducing the budget wasn't too tough. Second year it got a little tougher. This year it got really tough, in that the interior appropriation bill that I'm in charge of, we reduced it 19%. That's a top of the 18% we've reduced it the last couple of years. So they are substantial cuts. Fortunately, in my bill, we have the EPA, and I can reduce the EPA and take all the money out of that. They're reduced by <laughs> They were reduced by 35%, but this year we actually have to sit down. And this is the right question that we've been asking ourselves, is do we go through and just fund everything at a 19% reduction, or do we say, okay, what do we have to do? What is our constitutional responsibility fund? What are, our, what are our treaty obligations that we have with our uh, Indian tribes across this country? And what are the things that we might like to do, but we just don't have any money? And that's the right question that we should be asking ourselves. And that's what we've been doing in, uh, in our committee. Consequently, there are areas within the budget that got increased, and there are areas within the budget that got eliminated. Uh, that makes it kind of tough. Uh, but finally, we're making a connection, the members are, between the impact of the budget resolution that they passed and what that means in actual appropriations uh, that they're going to have to vote for when we get on the floor. Uh, they're difficult budgets, but you all know the financial situation in this country. We've got to do it. Uh, reducing spending is a key part to getting us to board a balanced budget. So I'm proud to work on that. I served on the budget committee for the last eight years. Uh, finally got relief uh, out, of, uh, out of that committee for, for the last couple of years, because that's a tough one. Uh, but, uh, it is, uh, I'm proud to be a member of the Appropriations Committee that's actually making the tough decisions of where we're going to reduce spending, and we get beat up for it, beat up for it. Uh, that's okay. That's what's got to happen. If you ate too many bacon and eggs and you had the fatty stuff half and half in your milk and you feel a little sluggish on your way out, good news. 
Larry Bouchon, heart surgeon, is here for you. <laughs> so uh, he, um, he, he can tell that look in your eye, and he's happy to unzip you and take, take care of everything. So uh, Larry represents uh, Indiana's 8th district. He's from Evansville, Indiana. He's obviously part of the Physicians Caucus. He serves on the Education Workforce Committee, Science Committee, and the Transportation Committee. He's in the Navy Reserve. I've been down to Indianapolis campaigning for Larry. He is really well thought of and a great addition to our conference. Larry? Well, thank you, Peter. Well, you clap and then he talks. Don't worry, it's all genetic. <laughs> In all seriousness, it's uh, you know it's really an honor to be here in con in Congress and with uh, a lot of fine members in the on the Republican side. Thank you for inviting us uh, here today. Uh, in in 2008, right after the presidential election, I was sitting in the doctor's lounge uh, before my case uh, that I had to do that morning. I can't remember what it was, and all the doctors and everybody were complaining about the direction this country is going to be heading in. This is probably January, February after after the president was uh, was sworn in. And I made a decision at that time, I told my wife, I said th that, uh, you know, I'm just not gonna be able to sit around anymore and just complain. And uh, I thought it was important that people, especially in healthcare, step up and uh, actually try to do something about it. And at that time, of course, Obamacare had not passed, but we, I could see the pathway that the country was headed in on healthcare, and we subsequently know what has happened. And uh, so I ran for office, and I think in that cycle, there were almost 50 physicians around the country running uh, in multiple uh, different states for obvious reasons. And so when, since I've been here in Congress, as Peter mentioned, part of the Doctors' Caucus, we focused on trying to uh, not only uh, back up the health care bill, but offer alternatives to the health care, to the Obamacare bill. And I found it interesting when the Republican Study Committee uh, yesterday released their alternative uh, to the uh, Obamacare bill, which I support their proposal, that the press said that this is the first comprehensive Republican alternative to the health care bill, which couldn't be further from the truth. A lot of the, some of the members here that were here before I was uh, had an alternative at the time. They've had, Republicans have had all kinds of private sector alternatives to get the cost of health care down. And uh, I'm, part of, I'm part of that. A movement to not only back up the uh, health care bill, which we know right now is, is hurting business and, and everyone else, but to offer conservative private sector alternatives that will get the cost of health care down. So it's an honor to be here, and uh, thank you for inviting me. So Larry, Rick, and Stephen have all come in at the same time. They were all the class of 2010. So let me introduce Rick Crawford, who, if this gets unruly this morning, and um, when the videotape goes off and folks at home don't, just really don't know how wild and crazy the mornings of the Rip on Society become, and this becomes a rodeo, then uh, Rick Crawford, former radio rodeo announcer, would be ready to handle you. Um, he serves on the Agriculture Committee, Transportation Committees, and uh, is from Jonesboro. He's in the, uh, served in the United States Army. Please welcome Rick Crawford. Well, I appreciate the opportunity to be here. It's, it's a real honor, and I'm one of those guys who, um, I think Larry described it, you just uh, reach a point where you can't sit on the couch and yell at the TV anymore. At some point in time, it's put up or shut up. So I decided to put up, and, and uh, we uh, went out in, 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 a, in a district that had never elected a Republican since uh, the Civil War. And um, you know we had the odds stacked against us from the beginning, but um, the, uh, the folks in, in our district in the state of Arkansas have really kind of uh, made a, a, a seismic shift in, in what has historically been a very democratic state. And um, we, did, we didn't come to them with a Republican message. We came to them with an American message, a conservative message, a traditional message of family values, the things that, that we believe in as Republicans, but but um, it's it's really all how, how you communicate that message. And, uh, we didn't dismiss those uh, <laughs> core values of, of uh, Republicans at all. In fact, what we did was embrace those and communicate those 
to, to our Democrat friends who are looking for a new home. And we feel like they found it. And we've seen a huge shift in Arkansas. Uh, and not only did we elect uh, three Republicans uh, in the House, we elected a Republican senator in 2010. And now, with one exception, our entire delegation is Republican. And uh, uh, not a prognosticator, but uh, he's up for re-election in uh, 2014. So it'll be interesting to see just how strong and how deep that commitment is in the state of Arkansas for, for change, but I think that uh, it's, it's truly been a sea change. And uh, to be up here in this era of, of reform, uh, which is really what we ran on, uh, fundamental reform of how Washington does business, it's not easy. Uh, we, you know, somebody said the other day, I was in a meeting, and you know, if we had a multi-party system, the Republicans would probably be uh, five of those parties because there are so many different lines. <laughs> I'm stealing that. It's <laughs> really good. You're going to hear that on Chicago radio. <laughs> and that, that says a couple of things. One, it says something about the ability of people like Pete Roscoe, who are able to uh, herd cats, in a manner of speaking, and also uh, you know, the challenges that we face in trying to find consensus. The Republican Party is full of people with great ideas, individuals that have a dynamic uh, ideas about how we move the country forward. And that's why it's so difficult, I think, for, for uh, people to come together around a, a central theme. And I think another way of looking at it is we all have the same strategy or the same strategic goal in mind, but we're looking and using different tactics. So what we have to do is find those tactical uh, agreements Employ those and, and deliver the strategy that American people want, and that is a, a new tone in Washington and a, a, a reform minded conference that's leading the way to a better country. So it's, it's a great time to be here, it's a challenging time to be here, and it's certainly an honor to be here at Freedom Society. Thank you. Finally, from Mississippi's 4th District to Stephen Palazzo, he serves on the Armed Services Committee, Homeland Security Committee, Science, Space, and Technology Committees. He's a small business owner and prior to serving in Congress, served in the Mississippi National Guard. From Biloxi, Mississippi, please welcome Stephen Palazzo. It's pronounced Mississippi. I appreciate that introduction and uh, it's great to be here. Uh, it's really nice when I was reading the, um, the email that said the workhorses of Congress. I wish uh, we could get that to my liberal newspaper back home. I think my constituents, which are very conservative, would appreciate that, that category. Because, you know, show, show horses just don't get anything done. They're all Know, full of their pretty faces and they talk a lot, but you know, they don't really accomplish much. Uh, so it's an honor to be called a workhorse, and it's great to be here. I do hail from southern Mississippi, Mississippi's fourth congressional district. Uh, it's a great, 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 great place. My backyard is the Gulf of Mexico, my front yard is the Pine Belt. I've got rivers on both sides. Um, it's just a beautiful place, truly blessed with uh, God's nature. Uh, great people, neighbors know each other, we take care of each other. We didn't need a Hurricane Katrina. Uh, to tip show us that, but it re reaffirmed what we already knew. And we're a great district because we're heavily military. Uh, so fortunate to have a large number of retired military call South Mississippi home. Uh, we have active and guard installations. Almost every branch is well represented. But we're also home to uh, a billion dollar ship building industry where we build some of the, uh, the world's greatest warships uh, that have ever been produced right there in South Mississippi in my district. Um, as Peter mentioned, the three committees that I'm on, I feel like I have a certain, uh, you know, uh, kind of my wheelhouse is national defense, homeland security, making sure uh, that as your as an elected congressman, I, I take our, I think our number one priority is the common defense of this nation, home and abroad, uh, seriously. And being a, a, a former Marine. Uh, which Peter left off. That's okay. This is, uh, I, got, I, had to, I had to plug that, and I'm um, also continuing to serve the Mississippi Army National Guard, and of course, the overlay of my district. Those three committees played uh, very well. But we started off with foreign policy, and I'd like to kind of end talking to you about our nation's space policy, because as chairman of the space subcommittee, uh, recently we just passed the, uh, the NASA 2012, 20, well, NASA reauthorization 
out of our subcommittee, and we're waiting for some floor time on a full house. And uh, we, we live within the law. Uh, and it's, it's tough, that, you know, we have to make some tough choices right now. Uh, and we had to live within the Budget Control Act numbers. And, uh, but we also tried to make sure, this is NASA, is pretty much, you know, they've been without a destination, without a timeline for, for a while. And it's, it's several, it's just not just NASA's problem, it's, you know, the administration's kind of hasn't really decided what they want to do. Congress is sometimes at odds with the House and the Senate. Uh, and then, of course, NASA sometimes, you know, isn't prepared to, to move forward. So we focused on uh, four key priorities. One, of course, is the space launch system, which is extremely important to get American astronauts on American rockets uh, from American soil back into space. A lot of people don't know. We do not even have that capability to send an American on an American, astro American astronaut on an American rocket from American soil. Did y'all know that? I mean, we can't. We don't have that capability right now. But the Russians do. And we pay them $70 million a seat to send an American astronaut to the International Space Station. So we're focusing on SLS, we're focusing on the James Webb Telescope, we're focusing on the International Space Station, we're also focusing on commercial uh, space where you know, we're looking at cargo and crew uh, because we recognize the fact that the private sector may just be able to do it a little, a little more uh, efficient and a little less expensive than NASA. And, we can't, and, with, and with the reality of limited budgets and limited dollars, um, we would like that low Earth orbit to go more commercial and then let NASA focus on deep space exploration. Now, what does this have to do with national security? Well, uh, from the military people in here, if you ever watched a war movie, you know, and you see these people up on a hill with a machine gun aiming downhill, well, who do you think uh, is in a better position? The people charging up the hill that are from the low ground or the people from the high ground? Well, the reason I say that is when you have uh, countries like China and Russia, our friends, uh, aggressively dumping money into the space program. Uh, that should cause some concern. You know, China's announced they fully plan on uh, going to the moon around 2020. And I don't think they're just going to go there and plant a flag and say, hey, done that, let's move on to something else. I think they're going to try to make some form of a permanent presence there. And so national security, there's no higher ground than space. And America needs to be in space. And if that's not enough of a reason, the NASA-derived technologies has, has helped everybody's quality of life in this room and all around America. Life-saving technologies in the emergency room as well as in the battlefield. Um, so that's kind of, you know, my wheelhouse. And I think uh, uh, if we need to um, protect America's legacy of space leadership, uh, unlike Vladimir Putin, I disagree that our problems stem from our American exceptionalism. That's where, that's where we begin, and I don't want to see that washed away. And uh, I tell you, if you think the farm bill is tough enough, wait until um, Chairman Lucas has to deal with crop insurance for solar flares, space dust, and meteorites. <laughs> that's going to be quite interesting. So thank you all for having me. Good segue. I appreciate it. So we're gonna we're gonna hit the uh, hit hit the high beams here. We got five questions in a little bit less than ten minutes. We can do this. It's the way I studied most of college, by the way. Um, okay. So uh, Frank, can you give can you give a sense for folks because they're gonna be reading all kinds of hyperbole, all kinds of drama about the nutrition piece today. Can you just walk them through and, and give them some top line talking points on what is actually happening and not you know separating out all the nonsense? The goal of the Farm Bill is not to take anything <laughs> away from anyone who needs help. The goal of the Farm Bill nutrition title is to make sure that those resources go to people who truly need help. Uh, in one section we do away with something called categorical eligibility. Uh, for uh, uh, almost 40 states, they use a loophole of the 1996 welfare reform law to say that if you qualify for any other federal welfare benefit, TANF or anything else, you automatically get food stamps without applying. We undo that. We say you need to go in and show you qualify your income, your assets. That's a $12 billion savings according to CBO. Uh, another area, LIHEAP, a number of states use another loophole in the 1996 law to say that any a uh, state that helps supplement the cost of their citizens' home heating uh, can then uh, basically provide them with a month's worth of food stamp benefits. You've got a handful of states that send out $1 checks to trigger $300 worth of benefits. 
I think most people would refer to that as mining U.S. Treasury. We say in that regard, state, you can still do that if you want, but spend $20, not $1. CBO says that takes the cost of the program from $10 billion to $2 billion. It's things like that, the, the category, the, the work requirements, simply saying if you're able-bodied and you don't have dependents and you qualify, we're going to, to give you, make sure you have an opportunity to work to qualify for your food stamps. Put some personal effort into the game. These are all things that are extremely popular back home because they won't take a single calorie off the plate of anyone who needs the help. But you're going to have to show you need the help. You're going to have to, if you're able-bodied without dependence, work for it a little bit. Self-responsibility. Rebuild that self-esteem. This is actually an effort to help people. And by the way, uh, use better, uh, better use of $40 billion of citizens' taxpayer dollars. Okay. Um, Mike Simpson, you've had a unique perspective as somebody who's run a legislative chamber in Idaho, somebody who served on the budget committee, and now an appropriator. How do you view the debt ceiling debate as being as playing a role, if at all, in the top line spending questions for our country? Well, obviously, all of these issues that have been talked about up here, they don't really make a difference if we don't solve our debt problem. I mean, we won't have any money for any of these programs, for NASA, for healthcare, for anything else, if we don't solve this debt problem. We've known this for a number of years. I can remember eight somewhat uh, years ago, uh, uh, former chairman of the Federal Reserve uh, Greenspan always came to our committee and said, listen, you've got a structural problem here. You've got to solve this problem. We all knew it, but we keep pushing it off. And what I've been pushing for over the last seven years, or the last three years since we got in the majority, is that we need a big plan to fix this. A simpson Bowles type plan. I don't know that that's the right answer, but something like that that fixes this problem. And what we've been trying to do over the last several years is balance the budget or get us toward a balanced budget by reducing discretionary spending, which we've been doing. But that's a small part of the overall budget. Today is 28% of the overall budget. We reduce spending in the discretionary area, but the budget grows because entitlements grow faster than, uh, than what we're able to reduce it. And I will guarantee you, everyone in this room, every member of Congress, Republican and Democrat, knows what we've got to do. you got a new tax reform that Peter was talking about earlier to make us more competitive uh, and to reduce the tax burden and get our economy growing. You've got to reform the entitlement programs, and yet you have to keep control of discretionary spending. We've done that part of it. The other two parts are hard, very hard, and they're not going to be pretty votes. I've told people I'm willing to make the ugliest vote in the world. It might cost me my election, my re-election, whatever. I don't care, as long as it solves the damn problem. But we cannot continue to kick this financial crisis down the road six months to six months to six months because it's bad for the economy, it's bad for the American people, and it's really bad for us. Okay, so. with that happy thought, <laughs> Larry, Larry, I want you to um, think of yourself as, as physician, not member of Congress. Yep. So you're coming in, you and your colleagues are, are working up a case, and how does the Obamacare overlay now change that dynamic, if at all? Is it different for you as a physician and a highly skilled doc? interacting in those environments with an Obamacare overlay, and if so, what's it like? Well, I think it is, because for me as a physician, I mean, what I care about uh, is uh, access to quality medical care for our citizens. And I think that uh, the Obamacare approach is going to really uh, not accomplish that goal. Uh, CBO has estimated even 30 million people may still be uninsured after the health care bill is fully implemented. And maybe different people that were uninsured before, but nonetheless, people are uninsured. What does that mean? It limits access to health care. Expansion of, the, of a failing program like Medicaid, which is not good health insurance, uh, will further limit access. You may have a Medicaid card in your pocket, but you may find in your community that none of your physicians take Medicaid because <laughs> it, doesn't, it doesn't pay the bills uh, to keep the door, keep the lights on in their office. And uh, so, I see the Obamacare being as a coverage uh, bill, attempt at the coverage bill, that's not going to cover everyone, and it does nothing to control the cost. So as the cost continues to go up in health care, the access to health care for our citizens is going to continue to go down. So uh, for me as a physician, I, I, the bottom line is what's good for my patient, and the Obamacare bill is not good for our patients in this country. It's going to limit access. And I think ultimately is going to result in 
a form of rationing of health care based on the dollars that are available uh, to pay for it. And uh, as a physician, that's just not the right approach. Rick, we had a, a very tough conference a couple months ago after our first challenge on the Farm Bill. And what I noticed was there were members who spoke passionately about how important the Farm Bill was for their districts. And they were speaking generally to the group, but there was a level of resonance of that communication to people who don't represent ag districts in particular. Can you speak to, as a member of the Agriculture Committee who's working with the chairman on this bill, can you speak to um, how this has an impact on your district and what, what difference a successful farm bill makes for you and your constituents? Well, in the state of Arkansas, we have uh, about 250,000 direct jobs related to agriculture, number one. Uh, number two, my district produces half of the U.S. rice crop in the United States. A lot of people think, well, I didn't even know we grew rice in the United States. In fact, we do. Number, uh, we're in the top five uh, exporters of rice in the world, and half of that rice comes from my district. So I'm very sensitive to that. We also have a, a large uh, poultry, uh, we're the second largest poultry producer uh, in, in, the, in the nation. So it's very, very important. And it's easy for me to go home and talk about the farm bill. And that's what they expect. I'm a former farm broadcaster. I'm an operated farm news network. 53 stations over five states. So this is an area that I'm passionate about talking about. But I think where we miss the mark here is when we talk about the Farm Bill, the role, and, 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 and Steve touched on this, the role that uh, national security, that plays in national security, we're already energy dependent. If we become food dependent, we have really said goodbye to our national security. And that is all part and parcel of why we need a Farm Bill and why we need to have solid farm policy. And I think Frank and I have had this conversation on, on numerous occasions. Member-to-member um, -member communication that works well uh, for those folks that, uh, you know, we know that we have 2% of this population engaged in production agriculture. That's a small, small sliver. And they produce on economies of scale so that they can feed not only the 300 million that live here, but folks that, that we feed in the global marketplace. Very, very important, but I would really put this in the context of the national security issue. The day we become net food importers is the day we concede our national security, and I don't want to see that happen. The farm bill is critical in that regard. Stephen, sticking on that theme of national security and recognizing it's 9 o'clock, um, what, uh, and, and as a Marine, can you give us <laughs> one <laughs> No retreat, no surrender. You're happy to be here today. That's good. Give us your insight on, and, 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 and try and summarize it. Give us your insight on the debate that we've been involved in on Syria in particular. Well, you know, that's, that's a good question. And the, the greatest thing that I've seen coming from the Syria debate is the, the loud and clear message the American people sent to Congress. And we, it was so loud we couldn't ignore it. So I'm, I don't know how that, what that has to do with national security, but. It, it says one thing, it says the American people, when they speak out, they want to be heard. So I am so glad that the president punted the decision to Congress, so it gave us more time, it kind of gave us the pause, so we could hear from our constituents. So and it's extremely important, but when you look at the many reasons why, and there were so many, I, I, I could list a whole page, and we understood that there was an atrocities committed, and, and, and you know, innocent civilians were hurt. But the majority of my constituents said, well, you know, I understand that, but it's a, it's a very dangerous place. It's been dangerous for a long time. Um, but we need to start focusing about Americans, taking care, you know, making sure America is secure here at home. And what is the unknown? If we go into this country, is, is, is it going to lead to something deeper, more protracted, that's going to cost us more treasury, more blood? Uh, and in fact, that we didn't have any credibility. You know, this administration has no credibility, no vision, no Middle Eastern strategy. It has a lot of people concerned, uh, but you know I, the conversations here today are great because you know when you look at national security, you can't have a strong national security if you don't have a strong economy. And we know how to create a strong economy, and it's, it was touched on. You know, one cut spending responsibly, balance the budget, and then grow the economy. You can't have one without the others. And growing the economy is tax reform. It's also removing those job killing regulations that the EPA and OSHA and all these other alphabet agencies put on. Um, our, our, our private sector. 
And so, but you can't have a strong national security without a strong economy. You can't have a strong economy without a strong national security. And we do need roads and bridges as well. I'm just going to throw that out there for Chairman Schuster. <laughs> <laughs> but I hope that answered your question. But I, I tell you, being in the Guard, um, just real quick, I had, I was surprised that 100% of my friends came up to me. These are Iraq and Afghanistan war heroes to me. Uh, they said, this is not our fight. We need to stay out. So not only do we need to listen to the American people, but sometimes we got to look at our troops. They're just not ready. They're not equipped. They have the spirit. They'll go wherever this country tells them to go, but sequestration is truly having an effect on our national security. So thank you all for having me. Thank you all. I'm prompting Jim Conselman to approach, and I'm going to make just one, uh, one, one observation. The Rip on Society this morning brought you five members of Congress, and they've described these people as workhorses. And I'm telling you, I work with them, and I interact with them every day, and that is an accurate description. Look, there's not one pretty face up here. Thank <laughs> <laughs> you. So they have accomplished this not through good looks. They have accomplished this through just saying, these guys are now figuring this out. It's like, huh. Oh, <laughs> But seriously, these are these are members that we need in this conference. These are members that we need taking on this responsibility because they are courageous. They are willing to to work with other people. They have a set of principles that they're devoted to. They're willing to hear people out, and they're willing to drive towards solutions to save this country. And it is an honor for me to serve with them. With that, as we say, we yield back the balance of our time. Thank you.